Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. We're going to wait just a few moments as more folks are being admitted to the program. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We'll be getting started shortly as soon as Zoom has let everyone in. Thank you for joining us. We'll be getting started in just a moment. Well, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Erin Lurie and my pronouns are she, her. I am the head of adult audiences at Hillwood and I am so glad to be gathering with friends near and far to celebrate Orchid Month. This month, the widest variety of orchids are in bloom, and we have experts. Drew Asbury is our fearless guide to help care for your orchids. I hope that those of you who are in the DC area will come visit Hillwood soon. We have some wonderful programs coming up. You can find out more information about each of these events on our website, but at the end of this month, we'll be starting a lecture series focusing on our newest exhibition, The Luxury of Clay. A few notes about today's program before we begin. Your cameras and microphones are not active, but we still want to hear from you. Please say hello from the chat and use the Q&A module, which is separate from the chat, to submit your questions. We have left plenty of time at the end of this program to tackle all the questions you have. It's now my pleasure to introduce Drew Asbury, Hillwood's horticulturalist and volunteer manager. Drew joined Hillwood in 2012 and is responsible for the greenhouses, cutting gardens, and the horticulture volunteer program. Drew has worked professionally in the horticulture industry for nearly 20 years in a variety of positions, including garden center sales, greenhouse growing, landscape management, and design. Drew graduated from Longwood Gardens Professional Garden Training Program in 2006 and completed a master's degree in sustainable garden design from George Washington University in 2020. Drew, thank you so much for being here today. Hey, thank you, Aaron, and thanks for getting us started. And uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our program today. Uh, we have a super busy agenda, and um, as you can see here, we're going to start off with uh, a little bit about, you know, Hillwood, uh, Hillwood's collection of orchids. Um, and then we're going to um, jump into the big world of the orchid family in general. We're going to discuss a few generalizations, as well as a few basic terms to that'll help our discussion today. Um, and then we're gonna spend the bulk of our time really diving deep into the, the cultural requirements of successfully growing orchids in your home. Um, and then we'll take us just a little bit of a sneak peek at uh, this concept of repotting, um, as well as some common pests and diseases. Um, and then at the end, we'll do a quick summary um, and we'll really stress those tips uh, for getting your orchid to rebloom. Because of course, that's the number one goal. And that's why we're growing orchids is to you know, be rewarded with their beautiful blooms. And then of course, at the end, we'll have time uh, for questions and answers. And as Erin mentioned, uh, she might break in with some questions and answers uh as we go too but but to get started here you know for those of you who are unfamiliar with us we are the former home of marjorie merriweather post um, who lived here at hillwood during the 1950s and 1960s um, and marjorie post absolutely loved entertaining here at hillwood um, and showing off and sharing her collection of artwork um, with others, um, as we can see here in this photo of Marjorie um, acting as the ultimate uh, tour guide of both her home and her collections. Um, and visitors today also still get to enjoy um, her, her world-renowned world collections of 18th century um, French decorative arts, as well as Russian imperial art. Um, and today, particularly, I think the museum's also a bit like stepping into a time capsule of the 1950s and 1960s. Off to the left here, you can see, you know, basically a fully functioning kitchen 
um, out of that 1950s era. Um, and we are talking about orchids today. So if you see there in the picture on the right, yes, those are cymbidiums and cattleyas um, and something else hot pink that got cut off. But uh, these would have been some of the first um, things that visitors would have seen as they entered into the mansion. Um, as for our outdoor gardens, uh, we are a 25 acre property. About half of that is natural woodlands, which is you know, quite nice to provide a nice buffer for the, the bustling city, which uh, surrounds us here in, in Northwest Washington, DC. But um, these, this archival photo from the early 1960s um, really starts to give us an idea of the property here uh, during the days of Marjorie Post. Um, we can see a large amount of the formal gardens, basically everything above this roadway here was the formal side of the garden. So here we had the motor court. Uh, we see the very most formal of all, this is the French, uh, uh, French parterre garden. We see just a little glimpse of the formal rose garden. Back here is a putting green, um, lots of different paths and garden rooms back here on this side of the property. But today, the greenhouses is where we're going to look, and that's actually located down here on the service side of the property. Um, this is where a lot of staff workshops and garages and homes were. This was actually the butler's house here. Here, which is our visitor center today, was actually the head gardener's house and the chauffeur's house over here. So the greenhouse and the cutting garden were part of these, the working parts of the property. And the idea was that plants would be produced in these areas and then cart it over to the house to supply fresh cut flowers, orchids, tropical plants, and other blooming plants um, to decorate inside uh, the house. So when Marjorie Post arrived, this little greenhouse here with the white roof, this was here. And over her tenure here, she added six more greenhouses for a total of seven greenhouses, the vast majority of which space was devoted for her collection of nearly 2,000 orchids. Um, and we have so many different stories about Marjorie Post and her love of flowers and in particular her love of orchids. Um, but one of my absolute favorite stories is how um, the orchids would travel along with Marjorie as she was moving from home to home. Um, because during the years that she lived here at Hillwood, um, Hillwood was just one of three homes uh, that she maintained simultaneously. Um, she lived here in Washington during the spring months and the fall months. And then during the, the cold, dreary winters of Washington, she traveled south to West Palm Beach and spent several months at her home, uh, Mar-a-Lago. Um, and then during you know, Washington's hot, humid, sticky summers, she would travel north to upstate New York in the Adirondacks um, to her retreat called Camp Topridge. And here we can see in this photo on the left from September of 1968, she's entertaining at Camp Topridge and there we see this really lovely, um, uh, you know, full arrangement of cut uh, banda orchids. And this was, this must have been extremely, this is still fair, a fairly extravagant cut flower in today's standards. So I can only imagine um, the, 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 the looks and turns that this would have gotten back in the 1960s. Um, and so these orchids would most likely have been grown in Hillwood's greenhouse and then either carted up with the, the caravan of, of staff and supplies, um, either as whole plants or as cut flowers, and then so that Marjorie can enjoy her orchids even when she wasn't here in residence um, at Hillwood. The picture of the right is really just an example. That's her little breakfast room that's right off the formal dining room. And that's where the, the floral displays just really stood out. Uh, and uh, you can see in the background there, lots of orchids. There's cattleyas, cymbidiums. These are big galoxinias here, uh, an African violet relative. We've got cut flowers. So obviously, you know, a huge fan of having her, uh, you know, life surrounded and filled with flowers. Um, and then here's proof um, with a little excerpt from her will where she requests um, that the greenhouses are to be maintained at the level characteristic of the period of the signing of this document for the benefit of the museum and the grounds of Hillwood exclusively, and that fresh flowers are to be kept in Hillwood at all times, as has been true in the decade 1957 to 1967. So this is exactly what we're doing. We're carrying on her wishes, keeping flowers inside the mansion. Here's the breakfast room from about a month ago. Uh, those are Phalaenopsis orchids here in the center um, and flanked by uh, seasonal flowers of Amaryllis. 
Uh, we've also started our own traditions. Here's a little cut flower vase filled with a cattleya. The cattleya was her favorite orchid of all, also known as the corsage orchid. And if we look closely at her portrait here in her bedroom, there she is holding on to a cattleya flower. And Drew, I know you yeah. mentioned that the orchids traveled with Marjorie Post. Yeah. Kathy Sykes asked if Hillwood is where most of them were grown or if they were grown in other locations to travel with her as well. No, it's a good question. From my research, there was a greenhouse down at Mar-a-Lago too, and then there was a greenhouse here at Hillwood. So uh, I would assume she also probably uh, knew other local orchid growers too, but in upstate Adirondacks in the 60s um, was fairly country. Um, so I would imagine that uh, I would imagine that those orchids came from here at Hillwood. Fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. So here's a current day view of the greenhouse uh, um, and some 60 years later from the days of Marjorie Post, I imagine she would still find this view um, very similar to the days when she would walk uh, the grounds. Um, and we still uh, uh, maintain a collection of nearly 2000 orchids uh, to this day. But of course, one of the biggest differences today is Hillwood now has about 80,000 visitors a year. So while we still keep a few orchids inside the mansion, the vast majority of our plants and our displays are outside and kept in the greenhouse year round. Um, as I mentioned, the greenhouse is actually a series of smaller greenhouses, which is fantastic for us as orchid growers, because now we have different environment, we can create different environments in each greenhouse by adjusting the, the heat, the light, the temperature, and so forth, which is a lot about what we're going to talk about today. Um, and also our greenhouses, if you are an orchid enthusiast, I highly encourage you to come check things out. We are considered to be a working greenhouse, which means that all 2000 orchids in our collection are out on display um, year round. So you get to see every nook and cranny of our orchid collection. Um, here's just one beauty, you know, run random beauty shot of our Phalaenopsis collection. Uh, these are known as the moth orchid. These are the ones you see for sale in every grocery store. We're going to be spending a lot of time talking about these today. Um, and then just another random beauty shot. Uh, visitors will pick up right away that we are plant enthusiasts here. So we um, intermingled with all of the orchids is a plethora of different tropical plants. Here we see the bright foliage crotons, um, exoras, and palms. All of these plants will be moving out of the greenhouses in May, going outside in the outdoor gardens, um, giving the orchids a little bit more room, and then everybody comes back inside for the winter time. Um, so it's a little tropical oasis, particularly during the depths of winter. And so now let's move on to our, our core part of our program today, um, which is all about caring for orchids at home. And I'll do my best to um, also make as many um, recommendations as I can um, for how to get your orchid to rebloom. So, uh, but first we'll do some basics here, you know, um, and that's that all of the orchids we're gonna talk about today and that are in Hillwood's collection um, come from either tropical or subtropical regions of the world. Okay, but with that said, um, orchids are extremely diverse. Um, they're one of the largest plant families in the plant kingdom, um, and they can be found virtually growing in every single habitat on the earth, um, other than solid sheets of ice on glaciers and in, and in, in the oceans. So otherwise, um, yeah, we have orchids that grow uh, right here in the mid-Atlantic, uh, about 50 native species right here in our region around DC. Um, and these are basically growing out in our woodlands and blending in with woodlands, uh, woodland spring ephemerals quite often. Um, so, you know, I think part of the, this whole idea of orchids being tricky to grow, well, part of that is, is because they are so diverse, right? So again, today, we're only going to be talking about plants that grow from tropical or subtropical regions, okay? And something that really, really, I think that makes orchids unique, and we're going to spend a moment talking about this idea of, of, of an epiphyte, um, and something that makes them quite different than many of our typical house plants, um, is that the vast majority of these orchids that originate from tropical regions of the world grow as epiphytes, okay? And growing and spending life as an epiphyte, this has major, major implications for how we're going to take that plant, 
out of nature, right, of how it wants to grow and how we're going to grow it in our homes. Okay, so if we look here at a moment, here is a Phalaenopsis orchid. That's that same moth orchid, the one at the grocery store, right? And we can see how it grows in nature. Okay, so an epiphyte um, is a plant whose roots um, not only absorb water and nutrients like how we normally think of roots, uh, but it's also using its roots to anchor itself or an, and attach itself um, to some type of structure. In this case, it's the tree trunk of some tree, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's somewhere up in the canopy um, amongst, uh, so not growing in the ground. Okay, that's, that's the takeaway, right? So imagine for a second, if you are that phalaenopsis there and you're growing on the side of the tree, right? When it rains, you know, you get drenched, right? Your leaves get wet, all your roots get wet. But what happens when it stops raining, right? The sunlight comes back out, the wind comes back out, and your roots are going to dry out fairly quickly, okay? So we start thinking here about, you know, the takeaway is, is that if we want to grow an epiphyte well, one of the most strategic things that we need to provide is a lot of air, fresh air around those roots, as well as this really, really quick, good drainage. Okay, these are, this is super important. So how do you do that? Well, up here on the top left here, you can grow an orchid attached to a piece of cork bark um, where you would uh, put your orchid here. You would use a bunch of string to, to initially, um, you know, attach that plant to the bark. And then over time, as that plant put out new roots or the existing roots grew, they would stick right onto that bark. Okay, I'm sure you've seen this if you have orchids at home. Yeah, over a two week period when you move it around, you often notice it has that, that growing point on the root has stuck to a piece of furniture or the floor or, or wherever you have your orchid, right? So that is how they naturally grow, okay? But yet growing it on a mount is a bit messy inside the home, um, which is why us humans, we put everything into pots, but this is why your pot absolutely has to have a drainage hole, okay? I've seen them for sale in glass bowls or vases, not a good idea. Okay. You have to have a drainage hole. And then this is why we often see orchids growing in a chunky media. Um, this is our Phalaenopsis potting mix here at Hillwood. It's a combination of bark, charcoal, and sponge rock or perlite. Um, and so you can imagine for a moment if you took this big chunky media that's filled with all these gaps of air, right? You filled a pot with that. You can imagine if you poured water in that, how quickly it drains through, right? So I know I'm spending a lot of time on this idea, but this idea of having quick drainage and air around the roots is super important to, to happily grow a Phalaenopsis orchid. Um, and this is also, you know, I'm, I'm skipping ahead a wee bit, but you can imagine what happens after a couple years um, to that bark, right? That bark starts to get a little softer. It starts to decompose. It starts um, turning into a little bit more what we might call more of a soil, right? Those pockets of air collapse and disappear. It doesn't drain as quick. So this is why it's critical with orchids um, is about every couple of years or so, you literally take it out of the pot, you remove that old excessive soil, you put it often back into the same size pot, and then you're refreshing chunky media around those roots. Again, to recreate that light, airy, atmosphere where those roots can breathe and have good drainage. So let's look at a couple of direct adaptations um, of living life as an epiphyte, right? We're going to look at pseudobulbs, fleshy leaves, and velamen. Okay, all three of these um, adaptations are a way of, of capturing and storing water, okay? So again, if you're living way up in the high, you know, the canopy attached to a tree, water might not be available um, at all times, you know, maybe it's just, you know, it only rains in the morning and you need water in the night, or maybe, um, maybe there's seasonal variations, right, where weeks go by without any water. So pseudobulbs on the left there, that's this structure here, and this is a really nice clear example of a pseudobulb, but pseudobulbs come in all shapes and sizes, uh, but basically that is a mechanism that that plant has evolved and that's storing water. So the easiest way to compare it to is a cacti, right? Like, you know, they're storing water in their trunks. Here, orchids are storing water um, in their pseudobulbs. Um, maybe if they're growing in a part of the world that truly does have a monsoon season and then a dry season, 
there are quite a few orchids that will actually shed their foliage during the during that dry season and all they are is a cluster of pseudobulbs okay so again when you're going through tough times you need to have some reserves okay so now here on the middle, the fleshy leaves example, that's a phalaenopsis. We're back to our moth orchid, or that, that's the one that's in the grocery store, right? That's the phalaenopsis. As we see here, it does not have an official pseudobulb, okay? And that's basically a sign that that phalaenopsis has evolved in a tropical climate where maybe there's fairly regular you know, intervals of moisture, right? There's not long periods of drought, right? So you don't necessarily need to store water, but yet a phalaenopsis, the leaves of a phalaenopsis are very thick and fleshy. And those leaves, just like a succulent plant, hold on to a ton, a ton of moisture. Um, ferns, on the other hand, have very, very thin leaves. So if a fern goes dry, it goes crispy, right? Phalaenopsis, epiphyte hanging up in the trees, you wanna be able to go dry, but yet, you know, you still get regular moisture. So a fleshy leaf is, is an adaptation that helps you go through those little bit drier periods. And then the last adaptation we'll look at is velamen. And that's what velamen is, is a spongy like layer um, that wraps around the true root of an orchid. Um, so what we're looking at here is actually velamen and the true root is super thin and tiny and it's in the middle of that, okay? So again, that velamen acts as a sponge. So when it does rain, it sucks that moisture up. When it stops raining, then it holds onto that moisture. And then it allows plenty of time for that, the internal root to slowly suck up that moisture and transport it up into the plant. Okay, so the takeaway here is that even if we don't know what kind of orchid we have, often the physical structure of the orchid um, starts giving us clues about how we're going to, you know, take this plant out of nature and grow it um, in our own home. And, and the last thing I'll mention is that, you know, there's a pseudobulb. Well, this is also a pseudobulb. You can see how swollen it gets, but it's a pseudobulb in the form of a cane. Okay, so again, pseudobulbs come in all shapes and sizes, but they're, they're all there to store uh, moisture. So a little bit more terminology here for us is this distinction between monopodial orchids and sympodial orchids. Um, you know, the, this is basically a way of describing their growth habit. Um, and while, you know, the growth habit doesn't necessarily help us figure out maybe necessarily how to care for our plant, uh, it does tell us uh, where to expect new leaves to develop, uh, where new roots and new flower shoots should develop, okay? Um, and it also has some implications for when we are repotting our orchid, how we position it in the pot, okay? So monopodial orchids, like this guy here on the left, that's your phalaenopsis, the moth orchid again. It's monopodial, meaning one foot or one growing point. The growing point on a, mono, on a monopodial orchid is right here, basically. This is where, this is the most recent new leaf here that comes out. The next new leaf is gonna come out and come off to the right. Then the next leaf will come out of the center and go to the left, okay? Um, new roots will originate off, the, off that main stem too, and they will alternate their way up the stem as they come out. And it's the same, here's the bloom stalk coming out here. Next year, it will come out between these two leaves. The following year, it'll come out between these two leaves and so forth. So you, you have a place to know what to look for. Now, with monopodial orchids and phalaenopsis in particular, often that new root and a new, sh and a new bloom spike look almost identical until eventually one decides to turn down and one goes up. And then after a little while, you, you, you start to put together the pieces of the puzzle. So that's a monopodial orchid. When you repot a monopodial orchid, because it's just one stem, one growing point, you put it in the middle of the pot, okay? It's common sense. But the big distinction here is a sympodial orchid, very different growth habit. Sympodial orchids grow, uh, their active growing point is actually on a rhizome, which is running along parallel with the top of the soil. So it's going along and then uh, somewhere at some point, it throws off vegetative shoots, which erupt and go straight up, okay? And so this is very similar to how a bearded iris might grow out in your garden or a daylily or even echinacea, right? It's a, it's a perennial clump that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but with orchids, now today we're generalizing a lot, okay? So there's always exceptions to every rule. But in general with orchids, um, these older growths that have already grown, 
will not necessarily bloom again. That's the general rule. And so what you're doing as an orchid grower, particularly on sympodial growth habits, is you wanna do everything you can to make these two new growths, first of all, at least as big or bigger than the previous year's growth. Um, and you're gonna give them all the environmental stimuli, which we're gonna talk about later, in order to have these two bloom, right? Most likely, again, older growths not blooming, but they're there photosynthesizing, storing water and food. That's what's helping give all the energy down to these two new babies down here. Um, so when we're repotting a sympodial orchid, we know these are gonna keep getting bigger. Next year, the new growths are gonna come out this side of them as well. They're gonna keep growing along a chain. So then we wanna give it a little bit more room when we're repotting where the new growth, where we anticipate the new growth to come from. So I know that's a lot of information. We're gonna be circling back around these terms as we work through the presentation today. Um, but let's review, okay? A Vanda orchid, this is, we have a lot of Vandas at, at Hillwood. It's one of our favorites. They're super easy. They require no potting media. They're literally just dangling up in the air, um, but it's an epiphyte, right? It's not growing in the ground. In nature, these would be also attached on the side of a tree or, you know, a, a, a some structure up in the air. Um, those roots using it, uh, you know, absorbing moisture, but also using it to attach itself to something. Um, it's a monopodial growth, so that means um, roots are radiating out along this one stem. New leaves are going to come out of the top, and then we can see the bloom spike here is coming up between these two leaves. Next time, most likely, it'll come out over here. You could see some old bloom spikes. There's an old one from a couple years ago, okay? Um, and then uh, Vandas are an extremely good example of velamen. And look how fat that root is. Um, but in fact, that's 95% of that mass is velamen, that sponge-like layer, um, which for us, we have fogging systems in our greenhouse that pop on and off every now and then, as well as during the winter time and summer, we'll also be squirting these down with the hose, uh, allowing that velamen to, you know, suck up all that water, um, and then they can go on about their day. So, so our one of our last big topics we're going to talk about before we get into the the good details of, of actually how to care for your orchid. Um, we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about. We've already talked about the Phalaenopsis a lot, that moth orchid. We're also going to be talking a lot about this guy. This is the Cattleya. Um, the Cattleya was Marjorie Post's favorite orchid. Um, it's known as the Crissage orchid. It's very fragrant. It's one that's just a really good one to learn how to know, uh, how to grow to. Um, and so, uh, but what makes them a little bit unique is that there's actually hundreds of closely related species and genera um, in this Cattleya family of orchids that we're calling the Cattleya Alliance. Uh, that they're genetically close enough that they can hybridize with one another. So for instance, if we have a Cattleya here, this guy could hybridize with a Brassavola, which right, looks very different, very different flower form, but yet very closely genetically related. You hybridize those together and you end up with something like this guy over here, okay? And what you end up with is what's called a Brassio Cattleya. That's a simple cross. Then you might take as an orchid breeder, you might take this Brassio Cattleya and hybridize it with a Lelia. And then you end up with a Brassio Lelio Cattleya, okay? That's still kind of simple. Well, nowadays there is so much hybridizing going on that it comes up with these crazy names. So the takeaway here is that we're clumping a lot, a lot of plant diversity and different Cattleyas are from different habitat, some are high elevation, some are low. We're really generalizing today. And I guess what I just want to say is so don't get disappointed if you go out and purchase an orchid and you can't find much information of it on home because there's so many, particularly amongst the Cattleya um, Alliance. Okay, We're going to treat them all uh, the same today. And then here is just a few pictures that really show this wide diversity of flowers. Again, this was Marjorie Poe's favorite. This was what was the most amount of orchids that were in her collection. And probably as a single group of plants, if we put them all together in this alliance, it's probably the largest group of orchids we also have. Um, but you can, till, you can still see how if you were to hybridize this guy with this guy, right? Who knows what the progeny would look like? And that's one of the 
lures and attractions to orchid growers and breeders. But that's a lot of work. I don't recommend that for beginners. We don't mess with that either. That takes almost uh, you know seven to eight years from the day you get pollination for the babies to actually get big enough to grow. That's it's uh, too much work. Too much work for us here at Hillwood. We like to have the nice blooming specimens. So anyway, now that we're moving on, we're getting down into our, like, our main core part of our program today, which is all about these cultural requirements, okay? Um, and what we're gonna do for the rest of the talk is we're gonna compare and contrast our moth orchid, okay, the grocery store orchid, and we're gonna compare that with the cultural requirements of a Cattleya. And often they're very, very similar. Uh, the changes are quite subtle between the two, but yet often have success with both of these plants it is slightly different cultural um, requirements. And uh, there's a little bit of a teaser and a, and a heads up. The Phalaenopsis, it's the easiest one. Um, highly recommended for beginners. Cattleyas, I think they're, I don't think they're the hardest thing either, but they are a little bit more uh, stringent or um, uh, the, the cultural requirements are a little bit more tricky, I suppose, uh, to make it to where you actually get it to bloom, right? And that's, that's the goal, okay? So, we're going to look at water, light, temperature, humidity. We're going to go through these cultural requirements one by one. But here it is, folks. All of these seven requirements, they're all interrelated to one another. And basically, as you adjust one of them, that often calls, it's a cause and effect. You adjust one, and that often causes another variable to change. Okay. So this is where the game of growing orchids come into play, that we're constantly tweaking these seven different cultural requirements. Um, but luckily, orchids are plants in general, plants want to survive, right? So there's lots of different ways um, to grow orchids successfully. Um, it's all about experimenting what works well with you. But this is exactly why every orchid grower you talk to will have a different tip and a different opinion on how to properly grow that plant. So today, this is the opinion of one orchid grower, it's mine, of what has worked well for me in the past. But I guarantee you, there are other ways to successfully grow orchids. Um, but um, what I love to show is this idea, we're gonna spend a moment on this too, is this idea of, um, I think this is particularly important for beginners of orchid growing, is to know that virtually every orchid grows on a one year annual cycle. And this is a little different than our typical house plants um, as well. Um, so this chart here begins to clump these things together um, and how all of these different cultural um, um, factors are interrelated, okay? So this implies that each year being on an annual cycle that there's a certain time of the year where an orchid will grow new leaves there's a certain time of the year they grow new roots. There's another certain time of the year where they begin to slow down a little bit, maybe take a rest or a dormancy. And yes, there's a certain time of the year that that orchid will come into bloom. And once your orchid, once you get your orchid on an annual cycle, it will do the same things year after year after year, okay? Um, so major takeaway here is your orchid should bloom once a year. Now there's exceptions, um, but unless they're babies and they just don't have enough vigor to bloom yet, but if you've bought your orchid in bloom, then yes, it's old enough to bloom and it should bloom once a year, okay? So water, light, and temperature, that's the three big main cultural requirements that really help that plant realize where on the cycle it should be, okay? Um, so it goes to no surprise, I think to everyone, that it's so much easier to grow orchids in a greenhouse, right? Like, I mean, I think that's common sense, but why is that, right? Well, that's because in a greenhouse, right, we can easily change those cultural conditions, particularly over the course of an entire year. So it's very easy in the greenhouse to provide during the warmer months of the year, higher light, uh, more day length, more hours of day length, higher temperatures. It's definitely warmer in the greenhouse in August than it is in January, right? So when we have more sunlight, more hours of daylight, higher temperatures, well, that lends itself to more water, right? It's just common sense. More water lends itself to more fertilizer, right? And then if we compare and contrast that to the cold days of January and February, right? We have less hours of daylight, so we have less sunlight, so less sunlight intensity, 
we have cooler conditions, right? Well, that tends to lead itself to less water, okay? So we're, we're gonna, I'm just trying to start putting some of the pieces of the puzzle um, together for you here. And so the worst thing to do if you're growing uh, orchids is to attempt to grow your orchid in a static environment. So if we think for a moment, like uh, maybe like a big office building uh, with cubicles, okay? So in that office building, maybe say the temperature is 72 degrees day and night, year round, right? No fluctuation in day and night, no fluctuation over the course of the year, always 72 degrees. And then the lights come on every morning at 6 a.m. and they go off at 7 p.m., right? year round. So you get the same temperature, the same amount of light. Because it's the same conditions, you're probably watering it at the same once a week, right? Year round. Well, that might grow beautiful foliage, but it will not provide most likely the environmental cues to put that plant on a cycle so it will never trigger into bloom. Of course, we're getting it all back to getting it into bloom. So we want to provide environmental stimuli uh, for our plants to bloom. So we're going to see this chart again. We're going to come back to this, but it was just a little bit. I know it's a lot of information, but hopefully now we'll break it down um, and we'll go through each one of those seven cultural conditions um, one by one. Okay, so probably the most frequently asked question here at Hillwood is how often do I water my orchid? And man, that is not an easy question to answer. And the, the easy answer is once a week is a good place to start. But really, um, it depends on what season is it, right? Is it summer or is it winter? How much light is that orchid getting, right? Um, uh, what type of media is it growing in, right? And, and then how old is that media? Is it fresh bark or is it bark that's three years old, right? We've already kind of hinted at that, right? Old bark's going to stay wet a lot longer than a fresh bark. If you're growing in sphagnum moss, which is quite common for phalaenopsis in particular, that tends to hold a lot more moisture than a bark-based media, okay? So it's, it's a loaded question to ask how often to water, but again, once a week's probably decent way to start. Um, but the better answer really should address uh, the proper watering technique. And I think, um, uh, so what I do, this is my kitchen sink at home off here on the right. Um, I take all of my orchids that have drainage halls, I take them over to the sink, I fill up the sink, I use that little shower attachment, and I thoroughly soak. Like, in my opinion, you cannot overwater an orchid at any given moment, um, and um, you want to let it drain. Um, it has to have that drainage hole, let it drain. And then the trick is, is that you want that plant to almost dry out before you repeat this process, right? Again, think of it being an epiphyte up in the tree, air and, air and dryness around its roots is the norm. So the last thing you want is an orchid to stay wet for two weeks, okay, in general, okay? So um, summer months, longer periods of daylight, warmer temperatures, more water, winter, less temperature, less daylight, less water, okay? So if we talk about Phalaenopsis and Cattleyas in particular now, um, if we mentioned before Phalaenopsis, they don't have pseudobulbs, right? But they have fleshy leaves. Um, and that's because they've originated in, you know, what I think of as typical steamy, hot, humid, tropical jungles, okay? Where there's lots of mist and steam and all this, right? So Phalaenopsis textbooks will often recommend them as moisture loving orchids, okay? But yet they're still a Phalaenopsis, I'm sorry, they're still an, uh, um, an epiphyte. So regular waterings, letting them drain down, then thoroughly soaking again, okay? Almost year round, but maybe slightly less in the winter time, okay? Now this is compare and contrast to Cattleyas, um, which do have pseudobulbs, right? So the pseudobulbs are those big, uh, water storage mechanisms, right? So again, the idea with an a, a orchid with pseudobulbs like cattleyas is that you definitely want to make sure they dry down between waterings, okay? Surely, uh, death will come more often from overwatering orchids um, than underwatering orchids. And if we look here for a moment, we get this, ask this question all the time about, you know, just add ice, okay? And I say, just say no to just add ice. Um, where in a tropical rainforest are there ice cubes melting on top of tropical roots, right? It's freezing cold water. It goes against my whole principle of thoroughly soaking. 
Um, I'm sure it works well for some. If it works well for you, do it, right? This is where there's tons of different ways of growing orchids, but often those same containers that are, have the just add ice, they're sitting in a little cash pot that doesn't have drainage holes. So I think it's just tempting um, working with, yeah, you're not working with nature when you're watering with ice cubes. Um, and again, media variation, some medias will hold um, more moisture, how old your media is. Well, you know, older medias tend to hold more moisture. Um, and then of course, think about those seasonal variations. Okay, so that's just the first one. We'll get back, we'll start seeing how this interconnects, but thoroughly soak and then allow your plant to dry down. And then if you're in doubt and you say, oh, is it dry enough? Well, hold off a day or two and then water. Okay, light, okay. Probably the next most common question after how often do I water, it's how much light does my orchid uh, need? Well, of course, again, this gets back to, you know, what type of orchid do you have? How does that plant grow in its natural environment, right? But for our conversation today, phalaenopsis are often considered by textbooks as low light orchids, um, which, is the reason why they're so popular and easy, but low light's a terrible term, but that's, we're, we're just generalizing today, compared to cattleyas, which are considered high light orchids. So now we really start getting our first big distinction between phalaenopsis and cattleyas is the amount of light. So for a phalaenopsis, folks will often describe an east facing window or even a north facing window, but folks, Every window, the east facing window in my house is probably different than the east facing window in your house. But you know, the idea is that it gets a little bit of direct sun in the morning and then just bright and direct light the rest of the day. Okay. Um, north windows in general it might be enough light, but that's that's tricky. But again, every north window is different. If you have an eight foot, you know, whole wall full of north windows, it's really bright with reflected light. Well, that's probably lovely light for a low light orchid. But if it's a tiny window <laughs> and you've got trees outside, then it's probably not enough light for even low light orchids. So a way to test with that is this is my uh, this is my kitchen window here in the middle. You can see a very faint shadow, okay? Um, being, uh, you know, subjected on these plants. That's low light. If you get a faint, hazy shadow compared to, this is just a random photo off the internet. Look at those direct rays and those really crisp shadows, right? Crisp shadows is a sign of direct sun and high light. So normally I always recommend to put orchids in the window, but if you were lucky enough to have a window with this much sunlight coming in, a phalaenopsis probably could, a low light orchid probably could grow on a table like this, you know, six, seven feet away from the window. Whereas I would keep my cat lay up, my highlight plants over here, um, right in the window. Erin, I see you've returned. How can we help you? I Anne? have popped right up. Both Marla and Helen have asked about southern windows yes. and whether it's possible for things to have too much sun, particularly yes. Helen asked about her phalaenopsis. Yes, yes, I have a huge, um, this is actually a, a west facing garden window at my house. And then I have a south facing garden window. And I thought, oh my God, I'm, it, this is amazing. I'm gonna be able to grow so many plants. Let me tell you, Aaron, I burn things up in my south facing window. So um, yes, yes, you can very easily, you know, but here's the deal, a south facing window in July that's a lot more intense than it is in January. So maybe it could handle that in January, but just simply moving your plants two to three feet into the room drastically cuts down on that intensity and um, you know whatever the term is used to, to measure light, light wattage or whatever, you know, it drastically reduces every foot you move away from the window. So yes, you know, so could you grow vandas or other really high light plants? Can you put up sheer curtains? Um, I have installed um, uh, some type of a, it was, it was called like a heat and glare reducer. It was almost like a tint that I put on my big uh, window, which drastically reduced the intensity coming in for me too. Or even here, you can see, I don't put plants. I have cacti on the top <laughs> and then I have underneath here and not up against the back of this west facing window, um, you know, are my orchids now. So yes, south windows could be too hot. Excellent. For folks who don't have as many windows, what do you recommend in terms of artificial light? Yeah, yeah. 
I was just, I was getting to there. So we'll, we'll fast forward. So yeah, no, I wish I was an expert on artificial light. Back when I, when I used to do artificial light back in the nineties, it was a very simple solution. You would go out and buy a four foot shop light and you'd buy one cool white bulb and one warm white or what they would call the plant bulb. Like literally there was, there was like three options to choose from. And now of course, Today, um, it's LED, right? And there's so many options on the market. I would highly encourage an LED light that is marketed towards plants only because I don't know all of the billion of different scenarios out there. So if you had a big north window, that's a nice way to supplement the light. Of course, you could have an entire situation like this, and many people will grow orchid collections over just uh, artificial light. There's really high intensity light, which gives off a lot of heat. And that's for the really serious orchid growers where you can grow, you know, virtually everything. Uh, you can grow any orchid if you align it and you do your research on the type of artificial light. So in my house in the basement, it's kind of my overwintering of some of the plants that just don't fit upstairs in my windows. So I have a couple of LED light fixtures and it's not necessarily to keep them in growing well and blooming, it's enough to keep them alive during the winter to where I can put them back outside in the summer. Excellent, thanks Drew. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, everyone, so at Hillwood, of course, we already mentioned how easy it is to grow orchids in a greenhouse, right? Here we see our cat Leia bench at Hillwood over here, okay? Just as we just mentioned, this bench is facing south. Okay, you can see all the direct rays coming in here. You can see the crisp shadows. Well, guess what's on the other side of this bench? It's a bench that faces north. That's where all of our phalaenopsis are. So, right, we often, even for our phalaenopsis, we have this extra layer of shade screening here besides all of these plants on this side. So, you know, these are the games we play as an orchid grower. Now, here's the takeaway if you've had a plant longer than a year, um, one of, and it hasn't bloomed, one, and one of the recommendations I'm going to give is most likely it's not enough light. You know, now if you've had it baking in a south facing window, you you don't have to worry about not having enough light. But generally, um, you know, I often hear people they'll try growing their orchid, you know, out in the middle of the room or on a bookcase or no, it, it really needs a window spot. And if you're not getting it to bloom, this is the space. Um, this is the chance of your opportunity to get this into a little bit better area um, with a little bit more light. Okay, so let me see my notes here. We talked about natural artificial. We mentioned that. Beware of intensity. Yes, yes. Particularly, I'm going to mention here later about summering your plants outside. That's when it's particularly careful that your plants could easily get sunburned, um, especially moving them from inside to outside for the summer months. Um, and then yes, seasonal variations. Um, it's actually kind of good. It's, it's, it's beneficial for your plants to, to match what is going on outside. So if it's able to provide longer day length during the summer and then shorter hours of day length during the winter, that's gonna be one of those um, ways that we can help that plant figure out where on the annual cycle um, it should be. Okay, we're gonna move on. We're gonna move on to temperature. Um, again, this is the third and the last of those three major cultural um, requirements um, that really affect, you know, healthy growth and blooming. Um, and folks, this is really, this is really the one, okay? I've alluded to it just a wee bit here, but um, textbooks both describe um, Phalaenopsis and Cattleyas as warm growing orchids, um, which implies that during the winter time, they never really fall below about 60 degrees or so. Um, and this is why warm growing orchids tend to be wise options to choose for, for, for growing in the home um, compared to cool loving orchids that want 40s and 50s at night in the winter. And then, you know, that's a little too chilly for me at home. But so, you know, as long as you have special conditions, you can grow cool loving orchids too. But, um, but here's, here it is folks, if there's one takeaway for the whole program today, okay, it's fluctuations in temperature and particular, particularly a natural dip in temperatures um, in the fall. Um, that's one of the easiest, easiest ways to help um, induce our orchids to bloom. Okay, so we're, we're going to talk about this why. But, you know, I just mentioned that we keep our phalaenopsis and cattleyas about 60 degrees in winter um, at, their, at the coolest. But I fibbed a little bit because actually in the months of September and October, um, we'll actually turn the thermostat down a little bit in the greenhouse, um, maybe only by about five or 10 degrees um, for a few weeks to a month. 
Um, this is often coincides with September, October. These are the same months of the year that you click off the air conditioner and you open your windows at night and that nice cool fall air comes in and you wake up and you're a little chilly in the morning. Well, that's exactly what we are doing here in our greenhouses because now our whole collection just went through hot, sticky, steamy summer conditions, right? Now we're letting that cool air come in. It's not just for one or two nights. We're doing this for a month. We're not doing this in January with 22 degree air. We're doing it in September with 50 degree air, okay? And so what this does is it tells all of our plants to say, whoa, it's time to slow down my vegetative growth and maybe I need to harden off my growth for the year, my leaves, my new leaves, my new roots, right? And maybe it's time to kind of sit back and chill a little bit, relax, right? Uh, and, and it starts to go into a, it, it just slows the plant down vegetatively. But as that process is happening, at the same time, the next step after slowing down is to gear up into flower, okay? So it's super critical um, and super helpful. So, but we have to remember, right? It's not just this change in the fall temperatures, right? At the same time now, particularly in greenhouse, right? We're letting these core conditions come in. Um, the greenhouse is, is only, the only light the greenhouse gets is from the sun, right? So at the same time of the year, the day length is getting shorter, 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 right? Now we're getting this cool air coming into our greenhouses. Um, at the same time, because we're getting less amount of daylight and cooler temperatures, we'll start restricting water a little bit, right? We're trying to give those plants all of these environmental stimuli, right? So at home, many, many orchid growers, including myself, and um, Hillwood has a, um, is, uh, has a, uh, a staff person, Andrew Beatenball, that is uh, dedicated to the daily affairs of our collection. Um, uh, maintaining our collection and both of us, we're both big fans of summering our own personal collections outside. Here's a little uh, a snippet of mine outside during the summertime in a very shady location. But the idea is, right, is you're getting, you're basically growing in a greenhouse when you're outside in the mid-Atlantic for six months out of the year, right? And then now you're also, your plants get to experience this cool dip uh, as well as shortening day length, okay? So, um, but at home, you don't have to grow your orchids outside. There's negative consequences of that. There's squirrels and, and slugs and insects and all that. So at home, can you crack your windows in the fall, right? Let that light come in. Can you put your plants in its own room? That's one of the easiest ways. I remember my grandmother always had this one room with the heater vents turned off, right? That was where her fern collections went, right? Gorgeous ferns in the winter time in a slightly cooler room, right? Often what we hear about when we have this class in person, there's always someone in the group that says, I don't do anything and my plant just blooms every, every winter it blooms. And I, you know, we often describe the scenario of where they're growing it. And it, it comes up over and over again that they have this really bright room that gets chilly at night, right? So um, often a lot of people would describe like a three season room, like this guy here, like a room that's filled with windows, right? Just naturally tends to get a little bit chillier. Like, again, we're not talking about freezing conditions. We're just talking about a little bit cooler um, than the rest of our house, okay? So phalaenopsis being shade loving, low light orchid and warm, a screened in porch would be ideal or just somewhere outside that's full shade on a balcony. Um, as you see, I keep my plants up off the ground. There's no saucers here, so they have good even drainage. Keeping them off the ground, attempts to keep a lot of pests from getting up into the plants, okay? Um, cattleyas, I mentioned they're a wee bit trickier to get to bloom because cattleyas not only appreciate this dip in the fall as well in temperatures, but cattleyas really like a difference in day and night temperature, right? We get that in the greenhouse. You get that when your plants are outside. Often in our homes, we don't get a 10 or 15 degree difference in day and night, right? So this is just you know, it's all of these variables that work together, okay? So lastly, please avoid cold and hot drafts. That cool air and fall, again, is that's not a cold draft, right? We don't want a 22 degree um, 
draft coming onto our plants. Also, the heater vents or the AC vents, um, that's really, you know, really changing the temperature quickly. Um, and the very first thing your plant's going to do, if you buy a plant in flower and bud, and then you're transporting it, particularly if transporting in very cold conditions or very hot conditions, um, wild swings in temperature is one of the easiest ways for your plant to say, whoa, I'm upset, I'm dropping my flower buds. So we often hear that question too, you know, why did my flower buds turn brown and drop off? Well, often it's these wild fluctuations in temperature, okay? So we talked about all orchids are either considered warm loving, cool loving, or intermediate, right? This is all again about their natural environment and trying to replicate their natural environment. Both Cattleyas and Phalaenopsis are considered warm, which is 60 degrees minimal, but yet a little chillier in the fall to help them bloom. We talked a little bit about the importance of day and night variations if you can. Okay, again, that's the opposite of being in an office in a cubicle of having the same temperature year round. Um, and then as well as seasonal variations. And again, so yeah, folks, if there's one takeaway, um, now we've said if we have an orchid that's resistant to bloom, besides moving it to a new location that possibly is, provides more light, a sunnier window, now we want to get it to where we can give it a month of a slightly chillier conditions in the fall to help get it on that cycle. Perfect timing, Erin. We were about to change slides. How can I help you? We have a couple of questions, and um, as we move on, I'd just like to ask folks to please use that Q&A module rather than the chat. I am trying my best to keep up with both of them, but using that Q&A feature means that I know whether or not we've gotten to them, and so they won't get lost by subsequent questions. Um, Carol asked for a little bit more information on what summer temperatures are, especially for a phalaenopsis. Um, you mentioned kind of that cooler low end at 60, but thinking about when it might be right to put plants outside. Yeah, that's a really good question. And honestly, I've never really thought about upper extreme end because I don't think there's any way for me to control that, right? So our greenhouses in the summer, we do provide some shading on our greenhouse um, with a, 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 a wee bit but it's, it's blazing hot in there. So, um, so the safe part of when to move your plant out might be a better part of that answer. And, and you really wanna wait until you start seeing lows in the, in the 50s consistently, which is still a, a wee bit chilly for a warm loving orchid, but basically that happens in our region about May. But again, a couple of years ago, we had a frost in early May. So, you know, keep your eye on that. By June, you're definitely safe to put your plants outside. Um, again, protecting them from sun right away, you know, maybe putting them underneath chairs, you know, you, you gradually want to um, introduce them, especially if, you know, you're changing their environment. So yeah, warm, I wouldn't worry about going too warm. Now, it's cool loving orchids like cymbidiums that are trickier to grow here because they don't want to grow in Washington's heat and humidity. So those are a little bit trickier and that's when, um, you know, you're growing them definitely, we, we move our cool loving orchids actually outside of the greenhouse and put them on a shady porch. Um, because we're trying our best to um, to keep them cool in the summer. Um, but yeah, warmth, good luck, good luck controlling the warmth in DC, right? Alyssa also asked, um, you just mentioned again that that transporting of orchids, that that some orchids can be temperamental, or at least that is their reputation. Is there something in particular that you want to be mindful of if you're moving a plant from one location to another? Yeah, you know, and I would say that's probably, um, there's a two part question there. It's, it's, okay, is this a brand new orchid for you that you're buying and bringing home? Like, that's a lot of shot, as opposed to having one that's in your dining room and coming up in the bloom and then moving it to your living room while it's on display. That, okay, so let's do that. That's an easier one. Most likely, your plant would be fine moving from one place to another, but unless you're moving it into the direct rays of, you know, uh, you know, you had it in a nice space, it was just bright and direct light, and now all of a sudden you're sitting in a sunny window or where the, the drafts can hit it, right, with the heater vents or the air conditioner vents, that will upset a plant, right? And again, the buds will be the first thing that will abort and, and say, oh, I'm out of here. But that's extremely potential, no matter what you do, if you're buying a plant in a store, 
because it doesn't, those buds will not turn yellow overnight. So often those plants that we see in the grocery store might have been overseas. Those things are, it's a global market. So that thing might have been on a plane and then it was on a distribution truck and then it was sitting in a warehouse and then it was at the grocery store and then it was you in your car. So those often will not bloom as long as when you have a, because they're in so much shock, um, compared to a plant that you have reared up, got it on an annual cycle, got it into bloom, leaving it in place. Once you found that perfect window, you know, phalaenopsis can easily be in bloom three to four months is probably the average. Um, a cat lay is three or four weeks. Um, but yeah, any change in the environment too quickly will shorten the lifespan of your flowers. Excellent. Thanks, Drew. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, everyone, we've talked about our big three ones. We're going to talk about two more. We grouped two together here. This is humidity um, and air movement. These are very closely related um, concepts um, and luckily a bit simpler to, uh, to, to, to achieve. So in general, most orchids prefer higher humidity levels in our homes than what our homes generally have. Um, so you can mist away, mist, mist, mist. Um, the, str the struggle with misting is that once that mist dries up and dissipates, often the humidity resumes back to how it was. So it's a very temporary fix. Um, so this humidity tray, this is probably the ideal situation here. Um, this is one that you, what the idea is, is that you would fill this reservoir underneath with water. You put the tray on top, then you sit all your plants on here. And then that, as that water evaporates over, you know, a week or so, you have a very consistent, but yet slightly higher humidity directly above the plants. Okay, here's a homemade version in my window at home. Um, again, gravel filled up with water, but yet you never want to let the bottom of the pot sit in any water at all. That's super bad for for the plant. So humidity is, uh, you know, it, it is critical. Um, another technique is simply grouping all of your plants uh, together into one space. Just having all your plants crammed together is a way to just naturally increase humidity as well. Um, of course, this was my garden window. When I first got my garden window, I was so excited because I was like, oh, I'm going to have the best plants ever. And I packed them all in like this in order to keep the kitties out. But as you can see, if you look back in there, um, kitties can be quite sneaky. Um, and so uh, this only lasted a season or two. And after each plant kept getting knocked off, you know, ultimately the kitties won. And this is now the new situation. So good luck growing orchids at home if you have cats, because as you know, um, well, kitties will win every single time. And I'm, I'm a softy. So that now the garden window, you just leave room in your garden window for the cats is, is my advice there. But um, Air, uh, air movement, that's very important for us in the greenhouse because our greenhouse is so hot, humid, sunny, right? We have a lot more humidity. So air movement is just a way to reduce the humidity. Um, I generally would not recommend that for inside the home um, unless you have a very large collection and you're growing in your basement. You know, that's often recommended in your basement anyway, if you wanna, if you have a humid basement and control mold and such, you turn a fan on because that naturally reduces the humidity, right? Generally, that's not as much of, a, of an issue inside. And again, another perk of summering your plants outside is you have a nice, lush, humid environment, um, which basically replicates the, the natural environment. Okay, fertilizer, right? Um, again, if we go back to our definition of an epiphyte, right? It's a plant growing attached to a tree high up in the canopy, right? So they, that is generally a place where you are not getting massive amounts of nutrients, right? Compared to plants growing in soil where there's a huge nutrient base, okay? So in general, orchids in general are considered to be light feeders, but they should be fed, right? Again, we want blooms. We want big lush plants and big lush blooms, right? Um, that's where fertilizer comes into play, okay? So um, they should be fertilized the most when they're in periods of active growth. When is that? That's when there's new leaves forming, new roots forming, um, new shoots. If it's a sympodial orchid, right? It's that warm time of the year, the warm months, right? We can water more regularly. The more we water, the more we want a fertilizer. Okay, so I'm a fan of this idea of feeding weekly 
weakly, which basically means you're feeding a very weak solution or a, a diluted solution um, very often, like every week. Okay. And then the idea is maybe you fertilize for a couple weeks in a row, a couple waterings in a row, and then you flush periodically with pure water. You can overdo it, right? Um, so two or three rounds with fertilizer during that summer happy time of the year. Um, as we start getting into fall, right, maybe we start, you know, reducing a little bit. Maybe we're not fertilizing much at all during the winter, particularly with plants that have big pseudobulbs or plants that want to have dormancies, right? So we're, we don't want to stimulate plants while they're in their dormancy. Now, what you see here is I, I have a picture of two, right? And they're often sold side by side on the shelf at the store, right? You'll see one that's often referred to as a bloom booster. This guy has a really big middle number. All fertilizers are done with a three digit uh, ratio here. And this shows the proportions of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Lots of uh, big middle number means it's for blooming, okay? a more balanced fertilizer ratio like this. This could also be 14, 14, 14, 20, 20, 20, 20, 14, 13. The numbers are more balanced. That's more what's considered for your everyday growing um, uh, uh, fertilizer. So during the bulk of the year, if I only had one, I would have the bag on the right. I would use this the majority of the year, starting from um, you know um, the second UC, which is often in you know spring, about now, right? Shortly after flowering, you'll often see a new leaf start forming on your phalaenopsis, or a new root, or a new a new branch, or a new node forming and coming out on your cattleya. Man, if you see that plant coming into active growth, that's the moment of time to really gear up and give it lots of fertilizer. It's actively growing. That's when it wants the fertilizer. Right. And then as we get towards the end of summer, right, we know, we know fall is coming. Well, then I'll start sneaking in a few applications of the bloom booster because I know I want to get those extra little nutrients in there um, that that plant might use to help, you know, produce more flowers. Right. And it's not necessary. A plant could still flower without fertilizer, but maybe you only get on your phalaenopsis two or three flowers where if you fertilized all summer and all fall, maybe you'll get eight or nine instead of two or three, right? So again, the more you're watering your plant, the warmer it is, the more humid it is, right? The more you can feel free to fertilize. During the middle of January and February, maybe it's just once a month. Maybe it's one fertilizer and then three rounds of pure water, right? This is where every orchid grower plays around experiments. So um, I would recommend an orchid-based fertilizer because these tend to be, if it's marketed for orchids, they tend to be very weak already. If you use like a standard miracle Grow, just please use caution. Those are much more concentrated fertilizers. And so they normally have a house plant, right? I would cut that in half or two thirds. So it's a very, very weak, uh, mild solution. Again, think epiphytes. Um, they're not needing the nutrients like our tomatoes do um, that come up out of the ground. So I think we always mentioned seasonal variations and feeding weekly, weekly. Okay, media. Uh, this is where you can have a whole entire discussion just on the world of work in media, right? There's hundreds of options to choose from. But again, every one of these options here is doing that idea of creating air around the roots and good drainage, okay? Like that's the takeaway. Very few orchids grow in your same potting soil that you grow your peace lily in or your, or your, um, you know, your, your typical house plants, right? It's chunky media um, um, that's often, um, yeah, bark here. With what we use at Hillwood is a, a plant bark called orchiata. Uh, it, you do not need to use orchiata. We just like it because it tends to hold up much longer so we don't have to repot as often. Most of the, the, the home improvement stores or online will make bark out of fir bark. You can see here, if it's a bark that's labeled for orchids, I think you're safe, okay? This is different than mulch or, um, yeah, traditional hardwood mulch, please do not use that. If it's a product marketed for orchids, I would, I would invest over if you're trying to grow your orchid well um, to actually use an orchid medium. Um, here, again, this is what we grow most of our orchids in. You can see a, a mixture of different sizes. Um, you know, if we have a little small plant, we might pull out these big chunks, right? But if we have a really big old cat Leia, well, maybe we take away the small pieces and we just have all big chunky media, right? Again, 
the games you play as an orchid grower. Um, and again, we're not going to go through these, but you can see the similarities. Um, you know, this is where a little piece of a little pinch of this and a pinch of that, and a, you know, this is what you'll start getting into when you Google um, what to grow your plants in. Here at Hillwood, this is our Phalaenopsis and our Cattleya mix. Basically, it's it's the same thing. Okay. And then repotting, just a moment on the basics of repotting. You know, we've kind of talked about why this is so important, right? We want to have, again, I've said it so many times, we want to have good air around the roots and we want to have good drainage, right? This is not a good looking situation over here. And it's hard to see that soil, but to me, I can already tell that soil is really broken down. It looks more like soil, right? So what do we do? Uh, we pull that plant out of the pot we remove all the existing soil. That's what's going on over here. Here was the old soil. You trim roots, any dead, mushy, brown, um, broken, you know, uh, nasty looking roots, you trim those off. You often put it back in the same size pot and then you're putting in fresh chunky media back around those roots to recreate. You know, when do you do it? We mentioned this with the fertilizing. When you see a sign of a new leaf coming here or a new shoot, this is what a new shoot would look like on a sympodial orchid. We mentioned that growing point is along a rhizome. When you see this form about this time of the year or a little bit from now, um, this grows out about an inch and then you'll start seeing new roots forming. These roots were the roots from this shoot from last year. This guy comes out, grows about an inch or two, he starts putting out roots and man, if you could time it to that window, that's the ideal time because then you're gonna have a less traumatic and a much quicker recovery because that plant is actively growing. Those new roots will then sink right down into your new media, right? This often coincides with that nice warmer part of the year is gearing up into where it's actively growing, you're watering a lot, you're fertilizing a lot. Now it just got new media to root into, okay? Not necessarily the best idea to do it in the middle of winter, you can, but it's a little bit more traumatic, okay? We're gonna have a talk uh, on the 25th of this month all about repotting. It's all we do, talk about repotting, and we'll do some live potting demos in front of the camera um, to give folks a, a good idea of how to do that. So, um, and then let's see, uh, just a moment on pests and diseases. We're almost, we're wrapping up here, folks. Um, at Hillwood, we struggle a lot with thrips, scale, and mealybug. These are the three big ones in our greenhouses. Um, but if you only have an, a plant or two at home, these would be the two insects I would check out for. These often come in as hitchhikers on orchid plants. But folks, if you really need, if you only have one or two plants at home, all you need is to pull out the rubbing alcohol at the same rubbing alcohol that's in your medicine cabinet, take a Q-tip, dip that Q-tip down into the alcohol, and then you literally use it to just wipe these plants, off, these insects off. You remove the adults, the little larvae, and the eggs all in one swoop. You can also just use plain water, swipe them off, and then it's, it, but it's not a one-time deal. It's something that you would check over and over again. These insects love to get down into the really tight nooks and crannies, so you will not get them all at once. Um, but yet, you know, every time you water, it's a good idea to inspect your plants. Here at Hillwood, I'm super proud to say that we are on our, our second year now of using only organic controls in our greenhouse and a great success with using beneficial insects to kill our bad insects. So these are all pictures of, this is a little wasp that flies around, the, he's tiny. Um, he flies around the greenhouse, he lays his eggs inside the scales. Um, and then, you know, basically he eats, you know, the babies eat the scale alive from the inside out. Um, that's how a lot of our, our parasitic um, uh, biological controls work. Little mites here, good guys that are out eating predatory mites, lacewing larvae, and this is aureus. Um, we release them in the greenhouse. They come in carriers. So if you're in the greenhouse, you'll see all these little piles of things all around. Um, the little predators will come out and spend the next couple of weeks while I'm home sleeping and doing whatever. I know here at Hillwood, we have these little predators walking around our entire collection, um, eating away on any insect pest they come. So you could recommend, I'd recommend Arbico Organics just because they have a nice website and you as a homeowner can order and have these shipped to you as well. 
Um, we do have a small arsenal of organic sprays that we will use in conjunction with our biological releases, uh, things like horticultural oil, horticultural soap, or we're particularly a fan of big time exterminator. This is in our, our, uh, all uh, food grade ingredients like clove oils, you know, these different types of oils and such um, that just works as a nice um, contact spray um, to kill our bad insects. Cinnamon is the last thing we'll talk about. That's cinnamon, the same cinnamon that's in your pantry, acts as a natural fungicide. This is a phalaenopsis with crown rot. But folks, if you lose your crown and the center growing point turns mushy on a phalaenopsis, that's a bad, bad situation. It's probably time to just say goodbye to that plant. But if you were going to try it, the cinnamon works well. Like say if you had a big black lesion here that was growing and turning mushy and soft, you could cut your leaf and then use cinnamon to kind of go on that wound or that, that cut as a way as a natural uh, deterrent of, of a fungus uh, spreading on your plant. And so as our cycle, our last photo here, we're going to review here. We're going to look at this cycle again. Again, um, you know, I put a phalaenopsis here as a cycle. This could also be the cycle of a Cattleya here. You can see we have the four seasons of the year. Again, I've had people ask me, well, this, they're growing in the tropics. They don't have four seasons. Well, but we're growing in the, the mid-Atlantic, right? We do have seasons. So, and that's a good way for us to get our plants um, to trigger into bloom, right? This is, this is how, this is how I think of it and how it works for me. So again, over the course of the four seasons, right, we have different environmental stimuli. We're going from this warm, lush, tropical type vibe here in Washington, D.C., of long periods of daylight, warm, moist, tropical conditions with higher humidity. That lends us to watering more, more humidity, more fertilizer, right? So what happens here at the top of the cycle right about now we are in the time of the year where our growth is just beginning to resume back after a winter's break so that becomes the time to repot you know you don't necessarily want to repot if it's in bloom and that's always a bit of a struggle and a decision to make but if your plant's not in bloom perfect time to rebloom is in late spring early summer then it's going to be able to have that lovely, you know, tropical vibe to grow in over the course of the season towards the end of summer into fall. You know, the conditions start changing, day length starts getting shorter. That's when we're going to throw in that fall chill layer, right, to really kind of shut down the plant for the, the vegetative growth for that season. It often takes a little while for the flower buds to initiate, but hence this is why um, the vast majority of our collection is blooming in February, March, and April. That's the three months out of the year that we have the most amount of blooms. And it's because, you know, all of our collection has went through the same cycle. It's the same reason why the Smithsonian and the U.S. Botanic and Longwood Gardens and the New York Botanic Gardens, everybody has orchid month around this time of the year because on the East Coast of North America, everybody's collection has gone through this similar cycle okay now there's exceptions other orchids bloom in other seasons but this is just the the bulk of the 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 the, the cycle for the vast majority of our plants and folks i think that kind of sums us up and as aaron said we do have this next program coming up on the 25th and um yeah aaron do we have any more we questions? have lots of questions oh, great. drew okay uh, Ren asked early in the presentation about the fact that sometimes their orchid blooms more than once a year and wondered if that is something that can be draining or and hard on the plant's health or if it's just something to enjoy because mine hasn't rebloomed in years. Yeah, you know, great question, Aaron. And we, I, I've heard this question before, and I, I think I answer a little differently now than I used to, because I used to, I did go down, like, first, bravo, like, if you got it blooming more than once, I mean, and it's doing it multiple years, then carry on, right? Um, we used to say um, often that the phalaenopsis, and we see one here in the background, right? This is a phalaenopsis back here. Uh, those can bloom, especially a big mature plant can easily bloom once you have it in your home and you've got it on the cycle and it's come into bloom a couple times and you don't move it from one room to another like 
it's not unheard of for those to be in bloom for an entire year and on the same bloom stalk because that bloom stalk will continue developing new flower buds as the older flowers fall off. So, and then what happens when it comes around back to that next season, you might start getting more new bloom stalks coming from the base of the plant. And that is where we would often say, well, maybe you should cut off that old bloom stalk, right? But honestly, Aaron, now at my house, like I, I can't do that. If I luck out and I have something that's blooming for a long time, I don't cut that thing off until it turns brown and it stops producing buds because that's what we're growing orchids for. So bravo, let it bloom its little head off, right? Now, if you do think your plant's unhealthy or sick, there is this uh, thing in the horticulture world that a plant will bloom right before it dies. <laughs> So if you're like in like intensive care orchid and it's blooming and it has a, well, yeah, if you want to attempt to save that plant and you know your plant is struggling, yes, cut off the bloom. But if it's happy and healthy, let it bloom away. I love that. We actually also have another question here about that trimming the bloom stalk. Um, someone has wrote in that they've gotten advice to trim the stem by a few nodes and that did help their plant. It bloomed again beautifully, but the new stem grew in sideways rather than vertically. Is there a way to prevent or correct that? Yeah, no, this is, this is all, um, yeah, these are all great questions. And yes, um, with a phalaenopsis, and we can see it with this picture in the background, if we have our big arching stem here, it's one of the exceptions to the rule. And this is one of the reasons why phalaenopsis are great for beginners. And again, often it's a little bit trickier to do this when you first get it, but you know, if you're at the store and it's a fresh shipment and everything, and it doesn't get upset, yes, what you can do is after this bloom stalk, often it'll keep producing buds as at the end of the stalk, but as soon as that tip turns tan, often then, as in that it dies out, it often that tan or brownness will work its way back the stem from the actually the tip back. And what some recommendations will be, and you're welcome to try this, is that you basically cut it almost where the first flower fell off. So often that's maybe a third to half the bloom stalk. Um, and then on those nodes, if everything's happy and it's strong enough, it can branch out off of those nodes. And so I used to say not to do this, but now I'm a fan of this because again, it's all about blooming, you know, if Enjoy you the blooms. Yeah, I mean, it might drain the energy. It does drain the energy, right? And it might prevent it from blooming the next year because it's spending so much time making buds up here, but flower buds are flower buds. So um, go for it. So, um, but again, if you're, if you're concerned about the health of your plant, then you remove the bloom salt completely. Um, when it comes to them coming on the side, yes, it is tricky. Um, I, you know, uh, often what is recommended is that you don't rotate your plant while it's coming out. We will actually stake most of our phalaenopsis once they come up. Sometimes they do come out on weird side angles and you just kind of have to work with it because they're very fragile. So, but if it does start to come up, you can see even how this one is tied with a stake in the background, that little twist, that little green's a little twisty tie on there. We will tie most of ours, but we don't rotate them. We let them come up and they arch towards the sun. We will grasp them and then we wait until flower buds start forming until we then take that plant out the bench and rotate it or put it in a display. Because if you keep rotating it, sometimes you'll get like the corkscrew effect of your bloom stalk. So they kind of do what they want to do. So, but you, you can try to gently manipulate it and keep tying it up as it goes if you want the perfect floral spray. But, but good luck. Some are really good at doing that and others are not so good at doing that. So, Once you do have blooms fall off, is that the time to initiate a change in watering? Or is that keep things the same until fall when you start giving it that cool cycle along with less water? You know, it, it depends, you know, again, too, if it's, is this a plant you bought or is this a plant you had in your home, right? Like, is it on the annual cycle of Washington, D.C.? Or was this a plant that was forced overseas in the Southern Hemisphere? And who knows, like, where that plant is on its cycle. So it often takes a year or more to get it onto your actual cycle. But once it's on your cycle, um, yeah, if it's a Cattleya, their blooms only last for two, three, maybe four weeks. Often blooming, you know, uh, uh, many of Cattleya species bloom right now this time of the year, and then you'll start seeing a new growth form. 
Um, and then that would be a great time to either start increasing water, but again, it depends on the season, right? Um, uh, but yes, there are other cattleyas that do bloom in the summertime, right? But yet they still like to have that, that annual cycle and that period of knowing when to grow their uh, foliage, when to rest, uh, but yet they still might wait four months after that cold snap or five months after that cold snap rather than two months to bloom, but it still helps put everybody on the cycle. Um, Sarah asked if you could talk about spray fertilizer, the ones that are already mixed up rather than the water soluble ones. Um, and if you do recommend that, do you put them on the leaves, any of the exposed roots that are growing out, where? Yeah, good question. Yeah, no, I, and I should have mentioned that even when you're watering, I water the foliage, the roots, everything. Same idea with the fertilizer. You you want to you you don't have to splash it on the foliage, but I do, um, and I definitely splash it on all those roots that are dangling out of the pot. That's totally natural and totally healthy. Um, uh, you don't necessarily need to force those aerial roots into a pot. So when it comes to fertilizing with those pre-mixed um things i've seen those in the store i think it's a little bit of a gimmicky like you can get it but you're spending a lot of money on a ready to use fertilizer thing which doesn't go very long but yes if you know I'm, and I'm, I'm not sure if there's you know you always want to read label directions when you're using fertilizers and chemicals and such but you know i would think you i don't know why you couldn't use some of the granular fertilizer that then you would dilute yourself into your mister. And then yes, you could use fertilizer water to mist onto your plants. You know, it might leave a bit of a white residue um, that might not be the most attractive, but um, yeah, by all means, uh, I, I think often we don't fertilize our house plants enough and that's that extra boost. You know, it probably, if your plant's not gonna bloom, it probably wouldn't bloom just because you give it fertilizer, but it's when it was already going to bloom because you're doing enough good things. And then if you're giving a fertilizer, then you've got marvelous blooms. So, you know, it's just just one of those factors that's going to help produce a, a, a beautiful display. Here at Hillwood, we, we fertilize two, three times a month during the active growing season. So we're, we're pumping out a lot of fertilizer into our orchids. We have a couple of questions here about roots. And um, Rosie just asked about dead roots and Nancy asked about cutting off roots. I am going to recommend to both of you that you join us for that repotting workshop where we're gonna talk more about that. But we also got an anonymous question here about those aerial roots, Drew, that you mentioned. Um, what do you do as those roots are escaping your soil? Is it something you should cut? Should you just let them be? Is that something that we should talk about when we have gather on the 25th to talk about repotting? Yeah. It's definitely something you talk about during repotting more. And that's the time if you're gonna address anything. Uh, I let them be, we, some plants will do that more often than others. Um, it's, it's, it's how they naturally grow. So yeah, those area roots are perfectly fine. Miss them. I would not cut them off. Like that's not the idea. Often, uh, they do get broken easily. Um, so, uh, but again, that, that outside root, even if it appears broken, it might just be that velamen layer, that sponge like layer that's broken and the true root is still there. So it's not, you know, but if it's brown and mushy, you know, that's a whole nother story. And that's what we'll talk about in our repotting class. Excellent. I do, I know we are getting close here to two o'clock. We've got, um, at least nine questions in the queue still, and Drew and I will keep answering them. Uh, so I hope that those of you who are waiting desperately for questions, please hang around. We will get to them. If you are not able to, we've already gotten a couple of questions about whether this program will be recorded. It will indeed, and that should be available up on our YouTube channel. I would imagine sometime next week is when that will get posted. Drew, can you also, if you're able to send me the slides, we've gotten a couple of requests and we'll send out those slides to everybody who registered so that if you want to consult that you've got something um, in your inbox that will go off, go out soon. Um, sorry, now I'm trying to catch up with all of my questions. So we have a couple of questions about leaves that are spotty.
Yeah. One asks about whether weaves turn permanently spotty if they get turned wet. Um, so if they, you know, if water pools there during a watering. Um, and then Margaret also asked about brown spots and burn spots. Yeah, um, burn spots are permanent. Most spots are permanent here. So uh, burn spots are often uh, 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 actually just take away all the, the thickness of the leaf too and just desiccates it down to where all the cells collapse. So often that's, it, that's it, yeah, it's not able to be repaired. So, uh, I, you know, it's, it, Orchid foliage in general tends to not be the most attractive unless you just happen to like architecturally interesting foliage. Like that's the most positive spin I can put on it. Um, and because their leaves grow so slowly, um, it, the more leaves you cut off because they might not look nice, well then you're reducing the substance and size of that plant to photosynthesize, store energy and all that to encourage a healthy bloom. So, you know, um, it's a tricky one. I do not have any concerns of foliage uh, getting wet as causing it. Uh, that Now, if you already had a pre-existing disorder or a disease of some sort, then yes, you might want to keep your foliage dry, but I don't believe moisture on the leaves would be the what would cause the spots. Now, sometimes if you put water on leaves and then sitting in too much of sun, that could accelerate a burning scenario. Um, but, uh, you know, generally, uh, if you do have any concerns, well, then maybe you would just keep your plants a little bit more isolated or not avo avoid splashing water from one plant to the next, I guess. Um, uh, but yeah, when it comes to foliar spots, I mean, orchids get all types of plant diseases as well. Um, but, you know, most of that is, um, you know, that's part of the, the fun of our you know, <laughs> the less trial and part. error and experimentation, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So here at, at, at a certain point, leaves turn yellow. We will take six sterile razor blades and cut those leaves off. Um, here, because we have such a big collection, we use uh, a butane um, flame to actually sterilize between cuts because we're concerned with a big collection about virus transmission um, and fungal transmission. So we have a little bit of different protocols when we see things like that. If it's just an orchid or two at home, if it doesn't bother you, I would let those leaves stay. But if, if it's driving you mad, well, then slice it off and move on. Um, well, and I think that that drives, we have another question here from Eve who has a, a rhizome based orchid saying a lot of the leaves are really long and straggly. Can I cut the, the really ugly ones off? And I think yes. what I just heard you say was yeah. in moderation, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. A moderation is probably a perfect way to do it. You, yeah. yeah, and I do that at home too. I, I don't like seeing ugly foliage. So um, yeah, if it's turning yellow, particularly, that's an easy one to say yes, because that, that leaf is failing and going. And if it's the older leaves or the older pseudobulbs, that's natural to a certain degree. If it's your new growth or your new shoot coming out for the rhizome that turns yellow or brown, well, then you're, then you're a little bit more trouble territory, but old leaves do naturally shed and each plant is different on how quickly or how long they'll keep their leaves on there. Marla asked if you could talk a little bit about signs that your orchid might be getting too much light. Uh, we just talked about burn, but there's also uh, too much light possible besides yeah. that, right? If you're already thinking your orchid's getting too much light, then there's probably a chance that it is. Um, you know, the, what they'll describe in books is the shade of green. And I, I've never been able to capture that. Like you really have to have a lot of experience to determine the shade of a dark green leaf as opposed to a mid green to a light green to yellowish cast, right? So it's often obvious on really shady grown plants how deep, deep, deep green the leaves get as opposed to extremely high light, they almost have a, a, a very even yellow cast, but it's just really, really pale light green. So, you know, it, it's a little bit of a trial and error with that and ex experience. The best thing you could do if you fear it's getting too much and just simply moving it six inches to the left or a foot away from the window, or maybe, you know, try a different window, but, um, yeah, that's a hard one to judge, Erin, without seeing the plant itself, I would say. What about with an artificial light in terms of the number of hours you should have that grow bulb on? Yeah, good question. I imagine there's different opinions on this. Uh, you know, they, I did mention the American Orchid Society today is a great source with, they've been around for 
ever. And they have so many helpful guides and they surely have guides for growing under artificial lights too. My um, opinion on artificial light has always been for all plants, not necessarily just um, orchid plants, is that you try to replicate similar to what's going on outside. Now, with that said, a lot of people will just keep the artificial lights on for long days. So they're getting more inputs. So maybe a 14 or 15 hour day um, and then eight hours of darkness. You don't want to leave it on 24 hours. Plants do do different processes at night. So they definitely need a dark spell. If you don't think you have enough intensity of light, then maybe leaving it on long days year round would be fine. Um, but I think it's those changes in light are just one of those variables that help those plants you know, get on that cycle and know when to bloom. Well, and I will say that we had a, um, a great lecture by Hilton Carter a few weeks ago, which is available in our YouTube archive. So again, I recommend you check that out. His focus is more on house plants than orchids, but he mentioned the idea of putting a grow light on a timer so that you can set and forget it. And yes, you adjust it seasonally, but in all of my years of talking to you about light needs for orchids, it, a, a light bulb went off while Hilton was saying that. So I'll pass it along in case it's of use for anyone else. Um, Irene asked about the fact that her orchids bloom and then they become frail and then they lose buds and they don't bloom again. And what I'm not sure about, and I think your first question is going to be whether these are new plants that you purchase when they are blooming, in which case you need to work to establish that cycle, right? Um, can you think of any other scenario? Erin, I think you're prepared to teach this class next time. No, yeah, no, I think um, it, it's exactly what Erin said. It, those plants that you buy at the store and you bring home, it's a 50, it's rolling the dice of what has been going on with their lives the month before you got it home. So, uh, but it's a little different scenario. If you've had a plant, it, normally that doesn't happen. So that would be my, my follow-up question. Like, is that a plant that you gear, you know, you actually grew the bloom stalk all along, blooms developed, bloom, like then I don't think there should be that big of a, you know, um, that's, yeah. I guess we need more follow-up uh, information on that one, Aaron. Phoebe mentioned that her orchids, the, the bloom time is kind of cyclical, that it moves later and later each year. And they're just starting to put up bloom stocks now. She wondered yeah. if that might be because the temperature drops in her bedroom at night to the, to the 60s. I think she's putting the pieces together. And I, I yes, and I'll say the phalaenopsis here at Hillwood start spiking month or two before mine at home. So because here the environmental stimuli are so variable and intense, like in the greenhouse, right? So our spikes are already up with flowers on them, but mine at home that have, were summered outside and brought in, like I, I have one that's just starting and others maybe where the spike, maybe the first flower is opening, but yeah, it's a delay at my house because of my environmental conditions and why it changes each year, I'm not, I'm not quite sure, but mine are on a variable too. And, and, and then there's some years, I, not all mine bloom, the majority of them don't bloom at home, right? So I'm just happy when I get some, you know, 25% of my collection to bloom each year. So we're all learning. It's not like growing in a greenhouse, which that does a lot of it for you. Um, growing in the home is all about finding that right window, tweaking the schedule from year to year, and then eventually just finding plants that you get along with and get along with you very well and that are successful for you. I think our last question, someone asked where they could source that Biscro orchid substrate that you mentioned. And I think uh, you said yeah. that that's available at most of the home improvement stores and yeah, plant um, shops. Uh, yeah, you'll see a lot of that. Yeah, that best grow, I think, was just off the internet at that one big, huge store we all buy from that delivers to your door. They the can remain day. nameless. That one, so. and then, um, but big box stores, and then a little local, not local, but a smaller orchid place. We do like Kelly's Orchid Supplies, Kelly's with an EY. Um, they have really nice prices, I think, and a wide variety of or like just orchid related supplies. So I would give a shout out to them. Excellent.
Well, thank you all for joining us today. For those of you who stuck around towards the bitter end, I am going to stall for just a moment to keep my eye on the chat and the Q&A to see if we missed anything that you are dying to know. But we so appreciate you spending your Friday afternoon with us and a great way to start the weekend. Um, Again, I am stalling, just checking and giving everybody the chance, but we will have the chance to answer more questions as well as watch that demonstration on repotting on March 25th. Keep your eyes on the YouTube page for videos. You can come back and um, get more insight from Drew on demand 24 seven. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, Drew. Okay, bye everyone. Thanks, Aaron.